Hi, thank you for joining us today and welcome to Food Co-op Initiative's monthly webinar series specifically for startups. This month, we answer one of the questions that we get asked the most, and that's, what do I do first? So Jake Schlachter, organizer at Let's Talk Co-op, joins us today to share lessons learned from his two years of working with startup food co-ops as a trainer with Food Co-op Initiative. For those of you who don't already know, Food Co-op Initiative is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission it is to enable the faster and more efficient startup process for retail food co-ops across the U.S. We do this by supporting grassroots organizers and communities, giving them no cost or low cost access to trainings, guides, one-on-one -on -one support, and grants. It's our job to help communities like yours get started. So this webinar is just one of the resources available to you. You can find more info at our website, foodcoopinitiative.coop, or you can just email us at info at fci.coop. Before we get started, I just want to introduce Somebody behind the scenes you can't see today, that's FCI's co-op resource specialist. Her name is Rosie Weaver. And myself, uh, Susie Carter. I'm the director for programs and partnerships with FCI. We'd also love to know who you are. So let's take a roll call. Right now, please type your name and food co-op into the comment box and hit enter. It's sort of a virtual hello for everyone here. Today's webinar will last one hour, including time for questions and answers. We anticipate this webinar will stir a lot of questions for you, and Rosie and I will be monitoring the question queue. If you have a question, you can go ahead and type it in during the presentation. Just know that we'll address questions live at the end. Also, slides will be available after the show, so don't worry about taking scrupulous notes. Just follow the link in the YouTube video after the show. All right, Jake, let's turn it over to you. All right, thanks a lot, Susie. Um, I'm not monitoring our YouTube feed, so uh, so Rosie, go ahead and, and put me on, and I'll I'll say hello to everyone. Um, but it's uh, it's great to see you all. Um, I love these webinars. You may remember a few that we did together at the uh, the beginning of 2013. I'm so grateful uh, to Food Co-op Initiative for inviting me to to come back um, now that I'm no longer on staff with them, but to uh, to do another one. Um, so let's go ahead and next slide, please, Rosie. Um, and just to say that, uh, that a bunch of these ideas are coming from a lot of the great pioneering organizing work being done by Marshall Gantz and the New Organizing Institute. And we've got some, some links for where you can get more about some of these leadership ideas. And next slide, please, Rosie. Okay, so <laughs> I wanted to start with, uh, with a few metaphors and, uh, and give you a metaphor for starting a new food co-op as hiking through uh, the jungle. Um, and you've got a map, and the map has been written by people that have gone there before you and had to blaze trails. Um, but, uh, but <laughs> you know, the map is hard to read, not always clear. It's written in three different languages, and, uh, and parts of it aren't written down at all, uh, but are locked up in a few people's heads. So this is, uh, this is an idea I introduced in a, an essay I wrote about a year ago about um, a que another question that I get asked a lot, should we start a buying club? And you can, you can read the rest of it uh, there. Um, but uh, today's webinar also grew out uh, about that same time uh, of another one of those questions. Um, it's, an, it's an effort to get one of those parts of the map that's currently locked up uh, in someone's head and to get that into a recorded form that we can then put on the website and uh, after that everyone can always have access to. Uh, but about a year ago, we realized that I was getting a lot of calls um, that uh, were essentially along the same lines. You know, what do we do first? And I'd have about an hour-long conversation with new organizers, and and it you know was was very similar what we were talking about. Even you know different parts of the country, different situations, but a lot of the ideas were actually common. So we thought, well, we should have a webinar where we record all those ideas. People can then work through that at their own pace, and then give me a call. Uh, and, uh, and that way, our first hour of conversation can be much more specific about the situation. So that's where this talk kind of came from. Next slide, please, Rosie. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I'm Jake Schlachter. I currently live in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, please send me a shout sometime uh, or, or tweet at me. Uh, but back in 2007, I was doing software development 
and realized uh, that organizing was actually my true calling. And so I made a career shift and moved back to my hometown uh, in Ohio in 2008. And we created uh, my first campaign, uh, which was for fair elections. And after that, I stuck around my hometown and uh, organized a new food co-op. And that's through that process is how I met Stuart Reed at Food Co-op Initiative. So I started working for FCI in early 2011, so almost three years ago, and have been training startup organizers since then. Um, I stepped down from FCI in June, um, and uh, but have gotten a chance like this webinar and uh, and the training we did last month in Chicago for about 50 startup organizers to continue to hang around and uh, and keep working with all of you uh, who are starting food co-ops. You give me so much inspiration. I really love the work, um, so it's fun to to be able to still be in the mix. Um, in 2014, I'll be, I'll be starting a new effort to bring co-ops uh, more into the mainstream of economic organizing uh, and play the, the part that we are destined to play there. Uh, I'm also working on the next generation of the Cooperative Grocer Network website, uh, cgn.coop, uh, which I believe will become the online social hub for food co-ops and how we share information. So if you're not already on uh, CGN, uh, definitely check it out. It's where a lot of very smart people uh, hang out and answer questions. And then in all my free time, um, I'm working on a book on organizing new food co-ops and, uh, and advising a student fossil fuel divestment group here in Madison. And um, <laughs> what else? Um, oh, yeah. And um, it turns out that organizing is a lot of storytelling. And so I also uh, really enjoy making films as a new interest of mine. And I hope you get a chance to see the film that we made last year. It was, uh, it was my first uh, in collaboration with Food Co-op Initiative. And it tells the story of FCI's work uh, with new food co-ops. Next slide, please, Rosie. So who do I think you are? I think that you are uh, a person who's strongly motivated, a uh, citizen of your community, doing civic work, uh, recognizing an unmet need, and wanting to do something about it. Uh, maybe it's access to organic and locally grown food, or making sure that, that even low-income members of our community have access to it. Maybe it's wanting to support local farmers, uh, giving them a way to market their food so they can keep more of their food dollars themselves, uh, rather than that going to distributors. Um, maybe, like my story in Ohio, you've got, you live in a town with 600 empty homes, and, uh, and you're trying to, to, you see the starting of a new food co-op is perhaps a way to uh, reintroduce a certain economic vibrancy to your community, bring people back to town. Uh, it's these and it's a dozen more reasons uh, why we start food co-ops and perhaps all of these reasons at once. Uh, and it's why food co-ops are such a powerful force for good uh, in our communities and why the people who want to start food co-ops are so diverse. So I think you are perhaps starting about starting up a new effort um, or perhaps already have an initial team and are looking for direction. Uh, in that case, fantastic. Uh, I hope that today's talk saves you from stepping in some of the, the quicksand uh, and pitfalls waiting for new food co-op organizers. Um, you also may have been organizing for a while and perhaps gotten stuck in one of those in one of those traps, which is not uncommon. So I hope that today's talk gives you some ideas about how to how to get back and uh, get back on the trail. Um, so I, I think you may be watching this webinar with us now live. Uh, but I'm guessing that 9 out of 10 of the folks listening to these words right now are probably watching this as a recording in our archives. Uh, so even if you're not here with us live right now, I want you to assure you that you're definitely part of the intended audience and that what we talk about today is going to be relevant to you uh, for a long time to come. So what do I think our goals are? Uh, well, my goal is for you in the audience to have come today with the question of what do we do first? And, uh, and hopefully... By the time you leave, uh, you'll know what the path in front of you looks like. Uh, you'll, you'll find the trailhead to continue this metaphor. And that's something that you can take back to your, your teams at home. Um, I also think that there's a gap in our food co-op literature uh, aimed at the getting new groups from zero to 60 miles per hour. And I hope that this webinar is, is something that helps to begin to fill that gap. Next slide, please, Rosie. So how's our time together organized today? Well. Introductions. We're done with that. Um, so the first thing I want to do is talk about how do we how do we prepare to start on this journey, um, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into how we're going to do it. Um, I want to introduce a, a couple of, of other ideas that I think are important: uh, the the pitfalls or the the anti patterns uh, of organizing new food co-ops, and then we're going to hold most of our questions for the end. 
um, and for the Q and A parking lot. Uh, but uh, but if you do have questions, please go ahead and ask them as they occur to you on the YouTube comments. And uh, Rosie and Susie are going to be monitoring that, uh, and they might be able to get back to you right away. All right. So next slide, please. Preparing ourselves for leadership. So I think that perhaps the most important attributes of a new co-op organizer are courage, commitment. And, uh, and also patience. Uh, so why patience? Well, it takes a very patient person to start a journey of a thousand miles, not with a single step, uh, but with a sit and a deep think about why do we want to start a journey of a thousand miles? Uh, you know, why do, why do I want to take this journey? Uh, who do I want to take this journey with? Why might they be interested in this journey? And why would they be interested in having me as their partner? Uh, what skills or qualities must I nurture in myself if I want to successfully complete the journey? And who has gone on this journey before and can advise me about what to expect or where I'll end up? Um, I intentionally chose the title of this webinar, What Do We Do First? Because that's the question I'm often asked. And my goal is that by the end of our time today, uh, we can reframe the challenge of starting a new co-op from one of doing to one of learning. The um, reason is, the one thing I've noticed over the last few years of working with startups is that no one ever starts a second co-op. Uh, so everyone who's doing this is doing it for the first time. Uh, and that's really interesting. You know, when was the last time that we did something uh, very complex uh, for the first time? You know, did we, did we make any mistakes? Of course we did. Um, but on the plus side, there are a whole lot of people who have done this before uh, and even live to tell the tale, <laughs> and can help us learn how to do it. Um, the groups that are then best at learning the lessons from others are the ones that come <laughs> come out of this journey on the other end uh, with, a, with an open store on that side. So let's reset our goal from what do we do first to what do we need to know first, or how are we going to need to grow first. Uh, next slide, please. Well, perhaps the first thing we can do is uh, is join the family. <laughs> uh, so you make food, make contact with the food co-op community. This is hard to see on the outside if you're very new and you haven't met too many people on the inside yet. Um, but uh, but once you join this community, it's like you're really joining a new family. So this is a, a photo I took at CCMA, which is the annual food co-op conference. Um, it's every year, and this year it was in Austin. It was in June, and I just, you know, this is my co-op family. I saw these these beautiful people getting on an elevator, and I was just like, I love these folks so much. I, I just need to take a picture where we're at, and so I grabbed this picture, and you can, you, I hope you can see how much fun everyone's having together. Um, so this is what I learned when I was starting up a new food co-op. Uh, there's this tribe of people called cooperators. And they take really good care of each other. They want each other to succeed. Uh, and our food co-op conferences are like family reunions. Uh, and you'll never meet another group of people that is so generous with their time and with their energy, with their goodwill. Uh, they want to help you organize successfully. Uh, but first, they need to know you're here. So if you haven't yet uh, had a phone call with, with Stuart Reed or Susie Carter at Food Co-op Initiative, then please pick up the phone, give them a call, uh, and, and let them know you're here and, and get to know them. Next slide, please. So I want to introduce another metaphor for organizing a food co-op, and that is marriage. Uh, here's a, here's a, since I wasn't in the last photo, I was taking that picture, I, I thought I had to share a photo that I could be embarrassed about. So uh, here's, here's actually a photo taken by a professional photographer um, <laughs> of, of my wedding last June. I, I got married to my lovely wife, Laura. Uh, and she and I, she was actually my partner when we started up our food co-op. Um, so um, imagine that we were having a webinar about how to get married. And, uh, and we called it, What Do I Do First? Uh, next slide, please. And so it's, uh, it's maybe a very naive idea to think that there's this series of milestones. You know, oh, we just need to find uh, and choose the, uh, the right guy or gal. Uh, and propose, and by the way, you have to propose successfully. And then you just plan the wedding and finally open your doors. Um, so, next slide, please. I would like to uh, to challenge this idea um, 
and, uh, and say that organizing a co-op is no more a process of doing things to your community than getting married uh, is a process of doing things to your partner. Uh, instead, it's this process of mutual growth and transformation that you do together. Uh, so just like you know, you're building a team, a uh, strong team, as you are, are courting and getting married, when you're organizing a food co-op, you are building a team with your community. Um, you're creating transformational experiences, both for yourself and for the people on your team and for your entire community as a whole. Uh, and if you do it right, you know, you're not going to be the same person when you come out of this journey as you were when you started it. Uh, and then you, <laughs> the other thing is, organizing a co-op, getting married, you definitely shouldn't rush it either. Next slide, please. So I, um, I teach a one-day membership uh, recruitment and organizing workshop for, for food co-ops, and that's what we did um, last month, November, in Chicago. I had a, had a great turnout. I had like 50 people. Um, and we spent a lot of time that day on, um, on talking about, about leadership and challenging this idea that perhaps is the dominant model of leadership uh, in America. And we just kind of absorb it. It's this uh, kind of corporate style, CEO style, or, or military style, the leader as the boss. Um, you know, I think we just tend to absorb it. And uh, so, so, you know, thinking about co-op as marriage, that metaphor, how long would my marriage last if, um, if I tried to be the boss of that relationship, if I tried to be the boss of our team? Um, you know, you may know Laura, you may not, but uh, let me tell you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take long. Um, and, uh, and so that's not what it's all about. Um, you know, our volunteers, which is, you know, which is everyone we work with, uh, our board members are volunteers, the people helping us start our food co-op, they're volunteers, we're all volunteers. So our volunteers are like our potential partners. Um, we can't tell them what to do. You know, this, if we were paying them or they were, you know, in our, in our army and we were the general, uh, then we could give them orders, right? But, uh, but as leaders of a food co-op, we, we can't do that. Uh, there's no force in, um, that we can use. Instead, we're, we're really creating opportunities for people to take action together. Uh, it's, a, it's a subtle but really important shift in our thinking um, to shift from this dependent model of leadership on the left here to the interdependent model of leadership on the right. Um, so going from, I'm the leader, therefore I have to make all the decisions, and I have to do all the work and get everything done, to this idea that actually... Um, we're creating a team, and um, and you know everyone gets to make decisions within their role. Everyone has responsibility for getting things done in their role, and everyone's got responsibility for being leaders uh, and for creating their teams as well. And that's what we call the snowflake model. So there's a lot of there's a lot that's been written about the model, and more information that you can find uh, about it. But it's a very powerful model. It's really taking over organizing these days. Um, this idea of, of interdependent teams of leadership rather than trying to create bottlenecks of leadership all at the top. Now eventually, our metaphor shifts from, um, from looking for potential partners you know, on our team to playing the role of matchmaker. And as we go out in our community, as we meet more and more people, um, we start thinking, who do I want to introduce this person to? Right? Um, so perhaps, you know, we meet Lori, and Lori is very dynamic and extroverted and loves meeting new people and having conversations and coffee dates. And we think, oh my gosh, Lori would be absolutely perfect on our membership recruitment team. I want to introduce her to the membership team leader, right? Or Anne uh, is uh, not, you know, too busy, not available during the day for, for lots of meetings and things like that. Um, but she does have an hour or two um, each evening after the kids go to bed. And she'd love to get online and help us out. So we start thinking, wow, that might be great for our social media. I should introduce her to the leader of our online team. Um, so we go from, from seeing our role as trying to get things done to really uh, building good teams and helping the leaders of our teams um, meet the right people and, and be successful at building their teams of volunteers. Next slide, please. So... We have a model of that style of leadership, and it's, it's the coach, right? The coach of a softball team uh, is not out on the field, is not uh, playing first base, is not, you know, winning and losing games, but still plays a very important leadership role. 
Uh, and so that's that's the concept of leadership that we're trying to go for here. This is my favorite part of my trainings, is when I tell people that their job uh, as the first organizer, or perhaps even you know the first eight people that are recruited, um, is not to do the work of starting a food co-op. There's, there's just too much. It's more than one person can do. It's more than eight people can do. Uh, our job as the early organizer is actually to, to identify the people in our community that are going to build the food co-op and recruit them uh, and then keep them working together effectively on our teams and help them continue growing. You know, the big shift um, is when we go from thinking of ourselves as leaders and responsible for this outcome um, to letting the entire outcome rest on whether or not our people are growing. Um, that, was, that was when the, uh, the shift came for me at, a, at an organizing training I went to um, a while ago. And, uh, and when our lead trainer, Hope, said that, uh, it just clicked for me. Uh, when we can get to that point, are our people growing? And if they are growing and they are in, a, in our position to be responsible for the outcome, uh, then our effort will be successful. So what are our tools for identifying and recruiting these people? Uh, next slide, please. So the primary tools of grassroots organizing are our one-to-ones and our house meetings. Um, so one-to-one, -one, very briefly, is just an intentional conversation, one person to one person. Um, we're building relationships. We are increasing the strength of existing relationships. We are asking for commitment, and we're keeping our commitment with others. And that's what forms our, te our, our teams. Um, our house meetings are, is just kind of a generic term for any group, any small gathering, 10, 20 people, uh, where instead of just building relationship between two people, we're giving an opportunity for our, our members, our volunteers, to also build relationships with each other. You know, we're, we're building many-to-many -many relationships. Um, these are both really important. Uh, and, and we've got a lot more resources for you on how to do both of these. Uh, next slide, please. So really, the name of the game here is, uh, is grassroots organizing. If you go and you uh, Google for, you know, how do I do membership recruitment? How do I start a new food co-op? Um, there, there are not that many resources written about, uh, about membership recruitment for food co-ops. But if we uh, Google for grassroots organizing, and all of a sudden, we see an incredible amount of uh, rich training and education on the subject. And uh, so the trick is just to realize that when we're talking about membership recruitment and, and developing our leaders and our boards, this is all going by the name of grassroots organizing. And there's a ton of great stuff out there. Next slide, please. And to get you started, oh, by the way, the, uh, the, the, tra the picture I used in, in the last slide uh, is, is uh, Michael Jacoby Brown is on the right. He's a veteran organizer and author of uh, Building Powerful Community Organizations, which is uh, the best book on organizing that I've read. Um, it's like having a coach with you, and uh, we use that as the companion textbook for, for my one-day class. Um, also, New Organizing Institute, we mentioned them earlier, they've got uh, a lot of recorded training workshops. And, uh, and that's based on the, the writing and curriculum of uh, Marshall Gantz, who's actually a professor at Harvard now after, after organizing for many, many years. Um, and, uh, and you can also find additional resources, videos uh, of the examples, and even two of the books written by Marshall Gantz and New Organizing Institute in the download for, for my slides for my one-day training. Okay, so we're going to try... Uh, next, to switch over to the whiteboard, and, uh, and we'll see how this works. All right, so we talked about how we're going to prepare ourselves as leaders. Um, let's talk about why we want to start a food co-op, and if, uh, if, Rosie, if we can go to the whiteboard now. Um, all right, so if this were a more interactive format, then, you know, you could tell me the reasons that that you all are starting a food co-op in your community. Um, but we, we discussed a few of those a little bit. And, uh, and you know, based on the reasons that I've heard people uh, suggest in, um, in our in-person trainings. Um, so whether we're, you know, trying to get access to healthy food or we're trying to support local farmers, um, then, you know, we can kind of generalize these things as, uh, as change for our community, right? I'm going to try to write this. Well, that's not going to work. 
um, I'm going to draw a point that our goal is is this change in our community that we want to see, right? Okay. And then um, starting a food co-op becomes this strategy that we are pursuing in order to reach our goal. Okay, and we're going to build a team. I'm going to I'm going to represent a team as a triangle here. I like triangles. So we're uh, we're going to build our team, and this is our leadership team. This is the the one of the first teams we're going to form uh, on our food co-op. And its goal, the goal of this team, is to start a food co-op. Great. Okay, so how is our team going to achieve its goal and start this food co-op? Uh, well, let's say there's a, there's a good number of members that we're going to need to recruit. So I'm just going to write 1,600 here. Um, it, that'll change depending on your community and, and the size of your co-op uh, and a few other things, but it's a good default number. So let's just say 1,600, and we're going we're gonna to delegate that goal. Um, so who are we going to delegate it to? Well, there's going to be a membership team. Right? We're going to say we're delegating this awesome, huge goal of recruiting 1,600 members to your team. And there's, you know, there's more. We're going to we're going to do some business planning so we can we can draw this on this side. And if you're wondering, yes, I am writing this with my finger, um, which is not as good as a stylus <laughs> in terms of handwriting ability. Um, so yeah, so we're going to come up with a business plan, and uh, it's going to need to answer certain questions, right? Like, what is our sales potential? How big must the store be to reach that? Uh, where will it be located to maximize the chance for viability and to reach this sales volume? Uh, what will be our market area? Where will our customers come from? Uh, how much money is it going to ultimately cost us to start up? And how will we raise that money? Where will it come from? Uh, and so on. Um, and as an aside, uh, please don't be intimidated by that list of questions right now uh, for two reasons. Number one, you are just starting out. So <laughs> you don't need answers to these questions yet. And by the time you do, you'll be ready for them. Uh, it's like you know, it's like raising kids. Uh, teenagers, I'm told, can be a handful. But uh, fortunately, you have years of experience uh, before you get there. Um, number two, these questions are basically a solved problem. Uh, if you work with Food Co-op Initiative, you work with CDS Consulting Co-op, uh, you will get the answers to these questions that conform to the generally accepted practices and represent what we've learned as a community, um, the best of the expertise over the past 40 years of, of starting new stores. Uh, you'll be able to, uh, to actually get bank loans based on the strength of the business plans and the answers to these questions, um, which is, is often not the case if you're not working uh, with these two groups. So FCI will guide you through these steps. Uh, you will probably work with CDS Consulting Co-op. You'll probably work with a lot of their consultants as you're starting up this store. Um, that's where the vast majority of, of expertise, uh, people who now make a living by helping advise new stores and new startup groups, uh, it's where they it's where they live. Um, so you know we'll, we'll talk about this in pitfalls, but don't have your local university um, do your market study. Um, don't <laughs> don't uh, have your you know a local professional who's probably used to doing market studies for other businesses, but probably hasn't done one for uh, for cooperative food retail. Um, you know those those are not going to be the best sources of support for you. Um, but definitely get um, get in touch with FCI and they'll walk you through all these steps. So just, you know, budget for consultants and relax on the business plan side of things. All right, so let's go back and, uh, and talk about membership team. You know, you'll probably have more strategic goals than just these two, uh, but, you know, for the purposes of, of drawing these, you know, this, these pictures and uh, this exercise, we're only going to draw two on here, but you'll have, you'll have more than two uh, and more people than, than two on your teams. Um, so let's go back to this team. Um, which is our membership recruitment team. We've just delegated this awesome goal of 1,600 new members to. So you know, that's more than any one person can do, so they're going to need to build a team in order to accomplish that goal, and they're going to come up with some ideas, strategies on how to do that. Um, so how might they reach their 1,600 members? Well, perhaps they're going to have a house party campaign, which are all the rage these days. Um, and they'll say, all right, we're going to set our goal of, of raising 500 members through a house party campaign. Okay, well, they're going to need a team, right, to delegate the house party campaign to, um, and so we'll create a new team to achieve that goal. And then maybe another strategy is, oh, we'll plan a media campaign, right, and we'll delegate a goal of 800 
new members through our media campaign. Um, and we'll need a we'll need a media team to delegate that goal to, right? Um, and so, how might our media team go about achieving this goal of 800 new members? Well, I mean, there'll probably be a social media component of that, right? And there'll probably be, we'll say, a TV component. Maybe we're going to advertise on television. You know, the idea is that these teams are coming up with a strategy for how they're going to achieve these goals. And when they do, they delegate those strategies. And as you might have guessed right now, yeah, it's uh, it's triangles all the way down. You know, so every every uh, branch and point on this picture is a strategy for how to achieve the goal that comes before it. And each of these strategies becomes the goal for the team the next level down. And there's probably going to be more than two strategies um, and more than two team members of each of these teams. Um, but we're, you know, we're only illustrating two at a time right now for, for the purposes of this diagram. Um, and uh, that way we get our nice pretty triangles. Um, and um, yeah, so, so let's talk about how we might achieve community change. Uh, up, up at the top is starting a new food co-op the only way to achieve our goal of change for the community. No, of course not. So how else might we do it? Well, we could start, you know, maybe a healthcare clinic, right? We could start uh, a healthy school lunch program. We could start a community garden. We could start a food pantry. We could start a buying club. We could uh, start a food co-op in a hollowed out school bus and drive it around. We could build a food co-op inside a cargo container and park it on the street. And if the location doesn't work out, we pick it up and move it. Um, these have all been done, <laughs> actually. So there's a million ideas here for how we can, we can you know, achieve the change in our community. Um, the important thing is that our team is going to only focus on one of these, uh, starting a new food co-op, right? And hopefully other people in our community are going to be inspired enough to start other teams that pursue some of these other strategies. But we won't um, because, you know, there's no surer path to failure than when we try to do everything all at once. Uh, there's a wonderful proverb, aphorism that I love, uh, Native American. I carry all my wisdom around in aphorism form. Uh, but it says, he who chases two rabbits loses them both. And I think that's very true when we're coming up with strategies and trying to figure out what paths we're going to pursue for our vision. Um, and the reason I stress this right now is because sooner or later, someone is going to come to your team, uh, perhaps even a member of your board, and suggest that you start a community garden or start a buying club or try any of these other strategies. Um, and they'll suggest that, that perhaps doing this is a way to help recruit new members. Uh, you know, if you start a buying club, then people will join the co-op. And uh, when that happens, and it surely will, it will be very important for your team to be able to say, that is a great idea, um, but it has, you know, it does not fit within our strategy of starting a new food co-op. Uh, and that is the strategy we're currently following. Um, <laughs> you know, which is a nice way of saying no. Uh, it's very important to practice saying no when you're starting a food co-op uh, because you will have many, many good ideas. You know, food co-ops are about one degree of separation from, from everything else going on in our community. Um, but we can only do one of these ideas at a time. Uh, but if a food co-op doesn't work out, does that mean we have to give up and accept the status quo? You know, no. Uh, we can go back to our goal of change and we can pick the next strategy. Uh, and try that. You know, there's no law that says that a food co-op brick and mortar store has to work in our community. Uh, so if it doesn't work out, then now we realize that actually there's a number of different ways to go about achieving the change we need to see. We're not stuck uh, if that, you know, if a food co-op is not going to be the successful strategy that we achieve. All right. So we've talked about leadership development. We've talked about um, why we might start a food co-op. Let's go back to the slideshow, please. And um, let's talk about how we will do it. Next slide, please. All right. Four cornerstones in three stages. Uh, so this is the model that the food co-op development community has standardized around uh, over the last 10 years or so. It says that uh, we are going to divide this process into three stages, initial organizing, feasibility and planning, and then implementation. And that in each of these stages, 
Um, there are four you know, critical ideas that we need to be thinking about. Uh, these cornerstones, vision, talent, systems, and capital. Uh, this model is a great way of helping us to not try to do everything at once, uh, but rather to think about uh, this journey as a natural progression of tasks and milestones along the way. Uh, so we can't walk into the gym and lift a 500-pound weight on day one. So we start with a 40-pound weight or, or maybe a 10-pound weight, and we build up our muscle over time. Uh, well, it's the same thing with our civic muscle, and it's the same thing with, with our team's muscle. Uh, we're building this up over a period of time by accomplishing smaller goals that add up to our bigger goals. So there's been a lot written about the four cornerstones and three stages model, um, and what gets done in which stage. Uh, and so if we keep our co-op organizing within this model, then there are a lot of people uh, and resources that will be available to help us. You know, this is kind of the, the map through the jungle here. It also tells us that we're not going to worry about what the store looks like, uh, you know, and where it's going to be located, which are uh, points for stage 2B in our planning stage, when we're still at the beginning uh, in stage 1 or even before stage 1. You know, this gives us permission to focus on the first things first and defer later things for later. Uh, so a lot of groups start around a building, right? Oh, this building would be a great place to start a food co-op. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's actually, um, that would be an anti-pattern, except that's the one we, we all recover from. I think everyone starts there. And it's, um, it's this process of learning about how we're going to go about organizing the food co-ops um, and, and learning that actually what we thought was a great place up front, um, by the time we, we get through stages one and stages two, uh, we've probably learned so much about food co-ops that now we know why that probably isn't such a great place after all. Um, or maybe, actually, that place is a wonderful place to put a food co-op. But uh, it, you know, if it's such a great place, it probably won't be on the market in a few years when we're actually ready to acquire it. Uh, and so it would be awful to hang all of our hopes on that one spot. Uh, so first we organize the membership in stage one, and, uh, and then as a membership, as a body, we determine where the best place for a co-op will be. And that's, you know, that's a process of our business planning. So the two circles are, uh, are kind of my contribution to the model, and it's just a way to bring the definition of a co-op into it. Uh, so the internationally recognized definition of a co-op is a democratic association that owns and controls an enterprise. Um, so we think about these two separate organizations, the democratic association and the enterprise. Uh, and there's a lot of people who overlap between those organizations, and they generally share similar goals, but, but they're separate. Uh, and it's important for us to keep them separate in, in how we think about them. Uh, the one is comprised of the membership, and it's headed by our elected board. The other is comprised of our workers. Uh, and is headed by a general manager. And if we realize that our job as organizers is to build this democratic association, and we focus on that, um, then we can agree and delegate the decisions of what kind of tomato sauce we're going to carry, uh, you know, what vendors we're going to work with, right? Uh, those questions are going to be delegated to our general manager and to our enterprise side. Uh, so those are not our concern right now. Um, so this helps us keep us focused on the things we should be doing for our democratic association, uh, which is recruiting members and learning how to govern a democratic association. And then we know that we will hire a very experienced general manager who knows how to run a grocery store to help us figure out the enterprise side. And it's just good to, to have that understanding and expectation um, as, we, uh, as we get into it before we get too far down. All right, so I'm going to try to go back to our whiteboard here, if we could. And erase what I wrote before. So I'm having trouble erasing. It's uh, just a sign of how we're embracing the future of food co-ops with all this newfangled technology. All right, cool. That's pretty good. Okay, um, so I want to give you a tool for thinking about how we can plan these campaigns. Um, so, you know, let's think about two different models for how we can uh, how we can structure our work as we move through these cornerstones. Um, 
you know, so so we are today, you know, nobody in our co-op but me and thee, right? Starting out at the beginning. And we have this idea of where we want to end up, our vision of a new co-op, right? Beautiful new store. Lots of happy windows there. I was joking uh, when we were practicing, I was joking that uh, I was going to be Bob Ross today and say, well, let's just put a happy little co-op right there. Um, so, uh, so, you know, let's say the first model, you know, is just we're here, we draw a straight line to get there. Uh, this is the this is the never stop doing model, right? It's never give up, never rest, never take time to reflect or evaluate how we're achieving our goals, uh, making progress, and never build in time to make teams and get our teams training, um, and just constantly increasing kind of like like tension and resources uh, in our organizing along this line. Um, have you ever been to a movie where uh, where the tension never stops increasing? Uh, we walk out, you know, exhausted. Right? We've never gotten a chance to rest. So I wanna I wanna challenge that because I think we fall into this we fall into this too easily if we're not consciously thinking about it. I want us to think about how we're gonna achieve our co-op um, with this second model, right? Which is we're gonna achieve our first major goal, and then we're gonna take some time to think about where we want to go next and what our next goal should be and what kind of teams we're going to need to build to achieve that goal and what kind of training those teams are going to need to achieve their goals. And then we're going to announce our goal, have a kickoff, and go get it. And then we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to build in some time to reduce tension, right? to give people a chance to rest, to give people that have been working really hard for a long time a chance to swap in and out. You know, when, when geese migrate, they swap out which, which goose is in front breaking the wind for all the other ones. And so we need to have an idea that le leadership is not something that, you know, if you want to start out, you're making a six-year commitment or something like that, but it's something that our teams are going to form uh, and reform after each of these goals and figure out our next goals and what training we need. And that meanwhile, you know, every time we set goals, we're setting them higher and higher and achieving higher and higher goals. And that eventually we have the resources we need to be successful uh, in achieving our co-op. And then we're going to hire our general manager. And our general manager is going to implement our store for us. And that is what success is going to look like. So I want to uh, I want to give you this. It's a, it's a campaign planning graph. And we can use it for just about any campaign. Uh, and it fits with our four cornerstones and three stages model pretty easily. And I'll, uh, I'll show you what that might look like. Um, but it's not just for our overall campaign, but we can even do this for, um, for planning mini campaigns um, in between. So, for example, not only might this be start to finish how we think about organizing a food co-op, but we can also use something like this for just organizing the house party campaign within a subface of this. And the idea is that, you know, at the top, our goal represents uh, the struggle that we'll need to have all of our resources fully, fully organized and engaged to achieve. Um, but we can't get there right at the beginning, so we're going to need a smaller group of people um, in order to be able to, to, you know, essentially run the campaign for the next leg. But we can't get there right away. So we said, you know, what's, what's this leadership team? What's this first team that we need to build in order to be able to achieve our, our larger uh, teams that are then going to help us go out and achieve all the resources we need for our struggle? So if we could go back to the slideshow, please. Um, I've got, um, this isn't going to make sense today, but I just want to make sure it's in the slides so that when you download this, you'll have it in the future. But, um, but this is how we can think about using this campaign graph for planning how we will start our food co-op in terms of our four cornerstones and three stages model. Next slide, please. So each of these um, each of these goals that we're going to set is you know what people call a smart goal, and I've heard a lot of uh, a lot of air and a lot of uh, dead trees around the idea of smart goals, uh, but they're actually really important. Uh, it's cliche, but uh, it's still something we need to think about clearly uh, and and intentionally set these these smart goals, or or else we tend to set weak goals, um, and so. You, the most important characteristic about a SMART goal um, is perhaps, you know, that it's measurable. 
right, that we're setting a firm number, that our, we're defining our goal in terms of how we're going to measure our progress towards it, and that really we're setting a date about whether or not um, our goal, you know, has been achieved, or, or whether we can say, no, we're, we haven't achieved our goal by this date. So if I say, I'm going to recruit 300 members by, or I, I should say, I'm going to, you know, lead a team that will recruit 300 members by, um, you know, October 1st, 2014, that is a SMART goal. That is very measurable. It's very hard. We know whether or not we're achieving it. And so that way, if it's been, you know, if it's been five months and we're halfway there, we know that we're on track to meet our goal. Uh, but if we, what if I just say we're going to recruit, you know, lots of members? Um, then it's not really clear about whether we're making progress and on track to achieve our goal or, or whether we're, we're recruiting some members, you know, but we haven't recruited what we need in order to be successful by a certain date. Uh, and that's just going to allow us to, to limp along without ever giving us an opportunity to reflect on our strategy and, uh, and replan when we need to. Uh, so definitely file that one away. All right. So then, now that we know about what the path in front of us is going to look like, next slide, please. How are we actually going to start out? And what are we going to do first? So here's my idea. I would encourage you to get a feel for what, you know, to, I want to introduce this idea of the keeper of the vision. If there's one person starting out, uh, then, then you know that you are the keeper of this vision until there's a team that you can, you know, birth the vision to. It's like, uh, it's like, uh, it's like having a baby, you know, it takes a while to nurture this baby before we have, um, we have a person that's able to make it out in the community on their own. Um, so it's, it's up to the keeper of the vision to research this vision. Uh, so I'd suggest calling up Stuart, calling up Susie, uh, calling up the general managers of other food co-ops, calling up people that uh, have started food co-ops, and doing some of these informational interviews, fleshing out your idea of not just what it's going to look like when you're done, but also what the journey is going to look like along the way. And then write that down. You know, have a one-pager that you're, that you're refining and drafting and that you can share with others to help them get an idea about what it is, uh, you know, is this vision. And, and then you're going you're gonna to take that vision and start having your one-to-ones. You know, you're going you're gonna to practice meeting intentionally with, with leaders in your community. And I, you know, I, I like to say, do five. Everyone can meet with five people, right? Call up five people, invite them to a 30-minute coffee date, one at a time, um, and share this vision with them. And then do five more. And then do 10 more. And in each of these cases, you're going to be sharing this vision, and you're going to be hearing about whether or not that vision resonates with people, or which parts resonate and which parts don't. And that's going to be valuable feedback for how to kind of revise this vision until you have something that you're like, you know what, this has broad community appeal. This is a powerful vision that we have put together here. Uh, and you're also going to have met a lot of people that you're always thinking about, is this someone I would want to go on this journey with me? Is this someone who has good potential for leadership that I think would make a very valuable addition to the team? So that is how we start. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we, as we find the trailhead, we walk into the jungle. Um, I want you to be uh, aware of a few anti-patterns. So we've been, you know, we've been doing this for a number of years now. There's this startup wave that we're currently in the midst of that seems to be growing stronger every year started in 2003. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of 12 years into it, um, and we've seen a lot of groups start up, and we've also seen a lot of groups fail to start up. And so we're starting to learn things not only about what works, but what tends to, to not work, what tends to introduce situations that are very hard to recover from. Um, so I want to introduce a few of these ideas to you all so that you can, can watch out for them you know, before you step in them. Um, and uh, so starting out with a public meeting, so I think we've just introduced uh, a very intentional process of, of keeping the vision and, um, and meeting leaders in our community uh, and finding out, you know, intentionally selecting who would be good on our leadership team. You know, we want to we dream up, you know, our perfect team, our dream team of leaders, and then we want to go out and build the relationships we need to recruit our dream team, right? The alternative to that is kind of, uh, coming up with our first draft idea and saying, oh my gosh, let's share it with everyone. 
let's you know let's call the newspaper let's let's call the TV station let's have a big public meeting let's see how many people we can get to show up and uh, and then you know commit to a vision that perhaps is not where we'll we'll want to be later on after we've gotten a lot of feedback and and it goes along with you know at the end of that meeting we'll ask hey who wants to be on a steering committee and people can raise their hands and that will be our leadership team um, and so that's that's kind of an unintentional process of figuring out who's going to be on our initial leadership team. Um, it's you know because the people that make really good leaders are usually very busy, <laughs> uh, and they tend not to volunteer when we say who wants to be on our steering committee. Um, instead, it's a process of building relationships uh, with our dream team until they say, "Wow, this you know I want to clear my schedule because this is the real deal, and this is the effort that I want to be a part of of leading." Uh, and that takes more time than a public meeting. Uh, and so, so lots of times the folks that raise their hands um, are not going to be the, the, the people that we wish we had on our dream team. Uh, another uh, anti-pattern um, is, is incorporating first. You know, we, we, we kind of hear, we need to collect money right away. And so in order to do that, we have to incorporate as a co-op, uh, and we have to do that right up front. Um, and to me, incorporation is like forming a relationship like marriage. Right, and it would be like, I don't want to get married until I've had a chance to date uh, my my potential <laughs> uh, marriage partner, uh, because you know whether you're on a board or you're getting married, that's like a legal relationship. There's there's actual legal responsibility there, and I don't want to just enter that with someone I don't know. Uh, I want to have a process of working together with people and you know seeing how people respond to challenges and whether or not they're going to get along with other members of the team uh, before we go and solidify that. And when we incorporate right up front, uh, it essentially says, well, in order to be a corporation, we have to have a board. And so we tend to we tend to set up that board faster than we would otherwise. So I don't think it's necessary. And it goes right along with um, with another one, which is collecting equity too soon. Uh, we're seeing, you know, it's like the decision to join the co-op and, and drop your two hundred or your three hundred dollars. Um, it's like an individual solution to a collective action problem. And what we're seeing now. Uh, is the idea of pledges starting to get more and more traction. And people saying, hey, we're not going to collect money from anyone until we have about 200 or 300 people that think this co-op's a really good idea and want to join it. And then we'll collect it from everyone all at the same time. And so that way, no one's the first sucker to lose their shirt. Uh, and, and it says that it's, it's up to our team to be successful and train ourselves enough and have a compelling enough vision that we're going to be successful at getting 300 people before we ask anyone for any money. And that re returns starting a food co-op, this collective action challenge, back to a collective action solution. We all do it or none of us do it. Um, it also prevents us, you know, if we're not going to be successful, right, um, then we haven't taken anyone's money. So maybe our leadership team um, doesn't work out. If we haven't taken anyone's money, then there aren't going to be hurt feelings. Um, but if we have taken money and some people lose their money, how likely are those people going to want to, you know, to be to, to want to join another food co-op that maybe is being organized a year or two years down the road? You know, um, we're not salting the earth for future organizing efforts by overpromising and then failing to deliver. Um, so, so choosing a, a niche or a fringe vision versus a mainstream vision. You know, so if we are able to to draft our ideas about a vision. And, uh, and begin to share those with community leaders, we're going to hear them talk about what might appeal to their constituents, you know, the leaders, the, the people that they are leading, um, and make sure that the vision we're coming up with is very mainstream. Um, you know, like, like a store, a large brick and mortar store is going to be serving thousands of people in our community um, and is going to have a lot of appeal to a lot of people. Something like, like a buying club, for example, uh, typically serves the needs of about 50 people uh, with, with less power and as a result of that uh, it usually gets less buy-in and less support from community leaders um, so um, so that's why we go through this process of, of meeting with people and refining our vision first hiring too soon or too late um, you know that's a tough one right you gotta you gotta catch the wave and you gotta strike that balance but um, you know too too soon and we're burning through our equity before we really know what we need to to hire a person for and, and too late um, means that we're uh, we're missing an opportunity to grow uh, as fast as we think we should be uh, because we will eventually hire staff of course to help us uh, take the co-op organizing to the next level um, refusing to hire consultants you know sometimes there's this um, there's this idea out there that um, that 
you know, anyone who's who we're paying for their expertise or advice is is uh, is in it for the wrong reasons or something like that, and and really they just that should not have a place in how we do this. Um, instead, we should be, I think, very glad that there are people that want to make a living by helping other people go through this process. Um, and and you know, they give incredibly. The consultants that I know give a lot of their time, um, but you know, they they need to get paid for enough of it, enough of it. Uh, in order to uh, <laughs> in order to keep their lights turned on, um, and so it, you know, instead, when we were starting up uh, in Ohio, we just you know we budgeted for that. Uh, we told everyone that you know we're not going to choose our location uh, until we've had a market study, and we're not going to try to write our own business plan on our own. We're going to you know we're going to have a team that's working on it, but in collaboration with other folks. And as long as everybody knew that up front, knew that we were going to raise funds in order to be able to do that. Uh, it was very successful and it was very widely um, understood by our membership. Um, and how about not focusing? We talked about this at the beginning, but we can't do everything at once. Uh, we really need to, to kind of have this laser focus on what are the most important things that are going to achieve our goal and focus on those. And the last thing is um, creating leadership bottlenecks. You know, it's like, it's like having that, that dominant form of, of dependent leadership where we think that one person needs to make all the decisions and do all the work. And that just burns out that one person, and it makes other people feel like there's not a place for them in the co-op. So if we change this idea to building teams and delegating real meaty goals that allow people to grow through experience and, you know, failure, uh, but failure is on the other side of growth, then we create these transformational experiences for our whole community, uh, and we all grow together. So that's all I have for today. Um, we've got a slide in two, Rosie, if you want to skip to it, um, on getting more information. So there's a lot written about these topics. I would love, you don't have to write this down right now, just grab the slides after this is over and, uh, and, um, and check these sources out. Uh, and with that, why don't we open it up and delegating real meaty goals that allow people to grow through experience and, you know, failure. Uh, but failure is on the other side of growth, then we create these transformational experiences. Susie, are you there? Hey, Jake. Sorry, I just had a little technical difficulty. Okay, it was weird. It was like I was listening to 30 seconds of the past. <laughs> uh, I was just refreshing my screen to see if we have any questions in. So if you're sitting there, um, Jake, covered a lot of ground, really, really fantastic. Um, so if y'all have any specific questions, please feel free to put those in the comments under the, the YouTube screen. All right. And you, I promise there's no test and you don't have to memorize all this at once. This is, this is something that we digest. We talk about these concepts with other people. Uh, we we coach others as they work through them, and we get coaching ourselves. Uh, and in that process, we all go through this growth together. I think that's the important thing to take away. Great, Jake. We get a lot of questions over at Food Co-op Initiative about. Um, I know you mentioned you know following two rabbits, and and you'll get none. Um, but but folks often hear that they can they can get strong um, by starting a buying club to grow their membership. Um, could you speak to that? Yeah, uh, I really want to. Uh, I so I, I wrote down a year ago. I was I was getting this question like several times a week, and I was like, I I just need to write this down. Um, so I would love to steer people towards uh, towards my essay where I kind of think through the reasons that people often cite. And you should all know that this is how I started. Uh, our co-op. We uh, we started with an online grocery, Stones Throw Market, and um, and it it that experience is well documented. Um, but uh, I guess the the important thing is that you will get some members because of your your buying club, but the members you get will be the ones that are interested in a buying club. And what we found is that that's often more about you know solving my own needs uh, and the needs of my family instead of solving our community's needs. And doing this large community service project, so that's what a food co-op is all about. You know, are we going to are we going to do a lot of work um, and take care of the you know so satisfy the needs of, of about 50 people, 50 families, um, and or are we going to you know create this you know large brick and mortar grocery store 
and solve the, the needs of thousands of our families, um, you know, create good paying living wage jobs for 150 people, do millions of dollars of business with local foods and keep that in the local co economy. It's just a, it's a much larger vision and it inspires a lot of, uh, of response in the community. Um, the one thing I would caution is that you know, trying, thinking that you can do both things at once because the people that we want to recruit are going to be looking at us and seeing how we spend our time and what we talk about and those actions are going to speak louder than our words. So um, if, we are, if we are telling people that our vision is a big beautiful grocery store but they see us spending all of our time worrying about a small buying club, they're going to conclude that we're actually more serious about this buying club. And that might actually keep people away. And that's, that's what we saw uh, with Stone's Throw Market in Ohio. Mm -hmm. That's great, Jake. And I think it really points to what we're hearing on the larger scale. It, it, um, the impact that we can have when we really focus on our food co-op can be so much greater. Um, so it is 3 o'clock, and don't want to keep you. want to want to honor everyone's time. So thank you, Jake Schlachter, for, for leading this great conversation. And thank you, everybody watching at home and, and everybody watching in the archives. Um, if there was a specific question that you didn't get answered, or if you just like some personal attention, uh, please know that that's what Food Club Initiative is here for. Um, so you can contact us at info at fci.coop. Uh, and look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Susie, and thank you, Rosie.